Well, hi everyone, I'm joined here with Miranda. We've just been talking today about a thing called parthenogenesis and looking at the whiptail lizards. But for those of you that uh, haven't seen that, you can check out the video uh, using the link below. But uh, Miranda's here with me today with a whole range of different specimens to explore this topic because it's something that I'm not entirely familiar with. So Miranda, thanks a lot for coming along today and uh, thanks for bringing along some of these cool specimens. Uh, we've been talking about parthenogenesis, uh, in particular looking at the whiptail lizards. Mm -hmm. For those that aren't sure, what, what is parthenogenesis? What does that actually mean? Yeah, so parthenogenesis is like sperm or male independent uh, reproduction. So in a lot of cases, it's just a female and she's able to produce offspring all by herself. Wow, so it's animals that are able to reproduce without needing an, 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 a member of the opposite sex to do it. Yeah, exactly. And some, some species like the Komodo dragon behind us, they can do it both ways. So they can reproduce with a male or if they're alone or isolated, then they can reproduce by themselves too. He thinks seems like a very useful skill. And it's interesting, you mentioned Komodo dragon can do it. This sounds like something that would be more common in sort of simple organisms rather than, you know, big vertebrates like mm. that. Is that. Is that the case or is this something we can actually see in, in a, lot of an, a lot of vertebrate animals that we might be familiar with? Yeah, so reptiles are the kind of only true pathogenic group and there's, I think, about 40 species that can do it. So um, just on this table, you know, we've got some lizards and some snakes. And what's really amazing is that they all kind of do it in a slightly different way. So there's lots of different outcomes. Sometimes they're all males or sometimes they're all females. Cool. Can we have a look at some of these then that you've brought along? What, what ones what have we got here? Let's, uh, let's start over this one here. These, tell us a little bit about what we've got here. Yeah, so I've got some lovely um, dried crocodiles here. They're saltwater crocodiles. So they're not a parthenogenic species, but I've brought them along because they can determine their sex using temperature. So just to kind of show that there's lots of really diverse ways that sex is determined in reptiles um, as well. Oh, that's interesting because we, we've, we've actually explored this before. So the temperature of the environment determines what sex they, they become, the young become. And that's something that we've seen uh, in turtles as well. We've actually got a video of that that we can share. So they don't use parthenogenesis, but they're using temperature. What about these guys? These, we've got some snakes in here, it looks like. Yeah, so these are anacondas that came from a wildlife park. So what was cool about these is that the female was kept in isolation for several, several years before um, she was able to produce these, these offspring. And unlike the whiptail lizards, which are all females, these are all males. So it, it can work either all males uh, reproducing or all females producing. And do the species, can they switch that on and off? So can the ones that reproduce all males, sometimes if it's an all female population, they can do that as well, or is it one way or the other? So in the whiptail lizards, we were talking about X and Y chromosomes, where the males were XY and the females were XX. But there's actually kind of lots of different uh, chromosome uh, kind of formats for reptiles, and snakes particularly have multiple ones. So depending on whether the female has the same chromosomes or different chromosomes, like X, Y, um, or in this case, said W, um, the offspring will be a different sex, depending. So these vipers also, the copperhead, they're also all males. Wow, and you said ZW just there. I've never heard that before. So X XY, I think, I think most of us are kind of familiar with XY for male and XX for female. What, ZW, what was that? So I think, um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think ZW is when the female has different sex chromosomes. So um, instead of being XX, the females are ZW and the males are ZZ. Excellent. And there's a couple of small jars here as well with a few other. What have we got in, in these smaller jars? Yeah, so um, these two are both invasive species. So they're found um, in a lot of countries that are not their kind of native range. And they're both parthenogenic. So this is uh, the Brahmi, Brahmini blind snake, which um, is a tiny little guy. And um, this is a little gecko as well. And so it's kind of one of the key benefits of parthenogenesis is if you imagine a female can reproduce by herself, all you need is one female to get to a new place and she can produce offspring and colonise another environment. Incredible. It gives them a lot of adaptability to kind of spread, which I guess is that one of the big advantages of, of this technique to reproduction. It's... Yeah. Yeah. So um, parthenogenesis is not really common, but it's quite advantageous to be able to colonise new environments with just one individual. Um, but I think part of that is, is because they're clones of the parents, they're kind of lacking 
genetic variability, which is one of the materials that enable you to adapt to new environments. Which I was going to say, yeah, if, if they're basically clones of their mother or their father, doesn't that make them vulnerable because they're not, they don't have the, the diversity. And, you know, the sort of classic biology that we're often taught is that um, mixing up the genes is a good thing because it means you're, you're, you've got a more diverse population that can handle changes in the environment, but that wouldn't apply with these animals. And yet it doesn't seem to be holding them back. Yeah, I mean, it's a kind of trade-off, isn't it, um, between which you choose. But one thing I would say is that most species that are parthenogenic are quite young. So that means they emerged quite recently in history. So it can be considered to be a kind of self-destructive trait because you can't persist for a very long time because you lack that genetic So I guess we have to wait, wait and see what happens in a way, yeah. like see how successful they are into the real, into the real future. That's amazing. And these are reptiles that you've got. Is this something that is, you mentioned it's not, it's not extremely common. Is it something that the reptiles have kind of latched on to more so than other major animal groups? Yeah, I think it's particularly um, common in, in reptiles out of vertebrates. I don't think that there's any other group that does it in kind of quite the same way, but I think there's about 40 species. And as you can see from the specimens here, you know, there's quite a lot of variation there, even in, in just, you know, how they look and the lifestyle and environment that they're adapted to. It's incredible. It's, it's amazing to think that, you know, nature has found a way of, of getting around this issue of if there's only one individual or it's just one sex that's around, doesn't stop them. They've been able to, to find a way and reproduce. And it uh, just shows you what diversity there is out there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Miranda. No worries. So there you have it. You found out a bit more about parthenogenesis and the incredible ability of some animals to reproduce without members of the opposite sex around. It just shows you how incredible nature really is. If you want to find out more about the natural world and have more surprising science, don't forget to click that like button and subscribe for more natural history content.